How's everybody doing? I was going to say we should do that twice, but I think once was pretty good. <laughs> Before I go into anything, I just want to tell y'all this morning how honored that I am to be able to speak to you today. How honored I am to be up here, to have the privilege to share with you this morning that my pastor thinks enough of me and has poured into me enough that I feel capable of even getting up here and doing this. And he doesn't have to share his stage. I want you to know that he doesn't have to share it if he doesn't want to. But he does. And if somebody were to come up to me today or tomorrow or any given day and they were to ask me what's something that I'm most proud about in my life, what's a great achievement for me, I would say without a doubt, it's being able to watch, listen, and observe from our pastor. So if y'all will, give it up for Jason. almost had me a little moment up here. So we are in a week four of our sermon series, Come to Worship. In week one, we learned about lifting our hands in praise to God. In week two, we learned about bringing our gifts in worship to the Lord. In week three, we learned about pouring out our hearts in worship to God. This week, we're going to be talking about bowing down We're going to be talking about bowing down as an act of worship itself. But before we get into that, let's pray. God, I ask this morning that I will be nothing but the mouthpiece for what you want to communicate, Lord. And God, I ask that not just here, not just in this service, and not just in our children's ministry, but all across this city and all across this area, God, that people are being set free, Lord. And that chains are being broken off of people's life. And they're coming to know you in a new and different way this morning, God. And I ask you to watch over us this morning as we go about our day. And all these things and so much more. In your name we pray. Amen. So the wise men are on their way to go see Jesus. And they had to travel many, many miles to get there. And what we see when they get there, what's the first thing they do when they enter into the house? They worship Him. Let's read that in Matthew 2, verses 10 and 11. It says, when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped Him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the first thing they did when they arrived was they bowed down and worshiped him. The Bible says they were filled with joy. Some translations say they were overjoyed, which we learn means joy on top of joy on top of joy to be able to get there and do this. But it's important to note that they had to travel almost a thousand miles to get there. And that would have taken them about two years to do so from when they saw the star arise. So scholars believe that what we see in our nativity scenes might not be, you know, uh, it might not 100% line up with how that actually looked. Because, you know, we, we see, you know, the, like the little ceramic ones that you set up on your couch or on your side table during Christmas. It's got the manger and it's got the little camel and the donkey and some chickens running around and the wise men and Joseph and Mary, but there in the middle, you see little baby Jesus in a crib. But in all actuality, scholars believe he would have been around two years old when they got there. And I find it funny what they did. They got there and they they bowed down to this two-year-old and they said, I worship you. How many parents in the room when I said that were instantly like, oh, there's no way. (laughs) Like, there's absolutely no way I'm bowing down to my kid. You know what that would do to the dynamic in my household? (laughs) I want you all to know I haven't had the the privilege 
to have any children. I don't have any kids myself. But I do have experience working in children's ministry a little bit. In my grandfather's church growing up, my sister led a class for the two through five-year-olds. And my cousin and I would go in there half the time to try and just get out of doing something else in the church. We would go in there, and she'd always put us to work. And I have seen kids, toddlers, in this class do some of the most irrational things. I've had a kid run up to me before, banging blocks together, laughing hysterically with animal crackers shoved up his nose. (laughs) Yeah. I've been in there passing out their little plates and putting their juice boxes and their goldfish or whatever it was on their plate and had a kid go flying by me at Mach 5 holding sticks of celery in his ear. Where he even got celery from, I have no idea. If you were to ask me, not that anybody is, what I would closely relate toddlers of that age to, I would say like little crackheads because <laughs> there's, there's just no rhyme or reason to anything they do. You know what I'm saying? When I was, it's funny, when Jason and I were talking about this, when Jason and I were talking about this, he was like, you're right. He was like, they do the darndest things. He was like, I'll be sitting. And for those of you who don't know, he has two little girls. One's a little older than two. One's not quite two yet. And he said, they will just run into the room and they will just stop and they will stare him right in his eyes and they will just crap their pants right there in front of him. They'll just drop a Mondo while they're giving him the death glare. And if he's, if he's lucky, they'll give him a telltale sign, like, like a little face twitch. But I say all that to say this, because when the wise men got there, and when they bowed down, it was to a two-year-old. And they said, I worship you. You know, as men, sometimes that's difficult for us to to, to let that sink in because it's difficult for us to kneel. Maybe our pride or masculinity or whatever gets in the way. And so there's really only two times, maybe, when we find it acceptable to kneel. One would be when you meet that special someone, right? And you decide that you want to spend the rest of your life with her. And so what do you do? You get down, you bow, you kneel, and you propose. And we're being honest up here today. And if we are being honest, most guys are probably just sucking that up in that moment because they're thinking about some of the benefits of marriage to come. (laughs) Just being transparent. The the, The other way that we sometimes bow, that we find it okay, is maybe you're in high school, you're in college, and you're playing sports. You and the boys just won the football game, and you're all lining up to get your picture taken, right? And you got the game ball, and you're looking all serious. Yeah, there you go. You're looking all serious, and you go down, and you kneel, and they take your picture. For me, it would have been when I was playing hockey, and I'd score an awesome goal, and then I'd slide across the ice, and I'd give them the old Gretzky one-two fist bump. (laughs) And ladies, you just don't kneel. There might be like one stipulation, okay? Okay. The stipulation that might be you're taking like a cute picture for Instagram or something like that. So you do one of those like little half kneels and you, you hit them with the duck lips. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. But it's difficult for us to grasp and get a hold of what it means to bow, and what it means to kneel. But on a serious note this morning, when you look in the Bible, Over and over again, you see the opportunity to bow in humble submission to God. I love what David says in Psalms 95. Let's look at that. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. Let's talk about that word worship for a a minute and what that means. All right? The Hebrew word for worship is shakah. Shakah. 
And when you look up the definition of this word, shaka, it literally means to bow down low in worship. It means to bow down low. We find this word in the Bible 170 times. But something that's interesting to note, not once does God tell us to bow down and worship Him. What do you think that is? As great and as good as our God is, not once does He say, do this for me. Do this unto me. But let me tell you, if we could get a hold, if we could grasp how holy God is, bowing to Him would be the least things that we would want to do. It would be one of the least things we would want to do is to bow down to Him. God is so holy, in fact, that when Moses asked to see God face to face, he said, you can't handle it. You can't handle seeing me face to face. You'll have to cover your face, and I will but just pass you by. And you can catch a glimpse of my back as I go. But you can't see me face to face. That's God's presence. And it says, after Moses came down from the mountain, after just having caught a glimpse of God, his face was literally glowing. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament talks about where... God's presence literally rests. Whenever they would transport it, they couldn't touch it. Whenever they would go into there, to to the tabernacle where it was, or they would move it, they could not touch it with their hands. They had to run poles through the sides of it, and they had to carry it because they couldn't touch it because God's presence on the ark was so strong that it would drop them dead where they stood. And one day, when they were transporting it, They became unstable and it started to shift and somebody reached up to stop it and he dropped dead just as soon as he put his hand on it. In the Old Testament, we also see about how whenever they would go into the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place, you could only do this once a year and it had to be a high priest. And they would have to tie a rope around his leg and put bales on his ankles in case he went in there and couldn't handle the presence of God. And if the bells stop jingling and the rope goes slack and they hear a thud, they couldn't even go in there to get him. They would have to drag him out by the rope. But not once, as holy as God is, does he ever ask us to bow to him. But what he does do, he does command us not to bow down to any false gods, not to worship any false idols. Whether we realize it or not, there's a lot of times that we don't have a problem worshiping things in the world. We might just not always realize we're doing it. We don't have a problem going to a concert for whoever it might be and and jumping up and down and screaming and worshiping them while they're on stage. We don't have a problem when we first get our paycheck not worrying about taking out anything for God at first, not out of the first harvest, but we instantly take money out and say, well, this is going towards this or this is going towards this, that new bass boat or a new closet full of dresses or whatever that might be. We don't have a problem bowing down to things in the world. But today what I want to do is I want to inspire you to worship Him as an act of bowing down. So here's two ways that we can worship Him by bowing down. Number one is we bow in repentance. We bow in repentance. In Luke, we read a story about when Jesus has just got done preaching a sermon by the Sea of Galilee, and he's getting ready to start gathering, recruiting his disciples. And he goes down to the water's edge, and he sees Simon Peter, among other fishermen, and other men down there by their fishing vessels. And he calls out to him and he asks, have you not caught anything? Where's your catch? Simon Peter looks at him and says, we've been out here all night and we have not caught a single fish. We've been out here for forever and haven't caught a thing. And then Jesus says, why don't you try this? Why don't you go out 
and throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Now, this is purely just speculation on my part, but imagine you're Peter in this moment and somebody comes up to you, you're at your job doing what you love that you've done so many times, and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, do that differently. Dusty, imagine you're at work and you're doing line work, you're working in a junction box, you're doing something that you've done hundreds, thousands of times, and a painter walks in and says, are you having trouble? And says, well, maybe, Maybe try doing it like this. If it was me, I'm probably going to look over there and be like, mm, this is how I make a living. This is what I do. I got it. Because it's important to note that he wasn't a novice fisherman. This was his profession. This is how he made his money. But what we see happen next is, is truly amazing. He goes out there and he does exactly that. He throws his net on the other side of the boat. And it says that his catch was so great that the net literally started to tear and the boat started to tip. And then he realized that he was in the presence of the Almighty. Let's look at what he said in Luke 5, 8. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. When he realized who he was talking to, when he realized what was going on, he said, please forgive me. I'm such a sinful man. I want you to know something this morning. I want you to know that Jesus will never turn away a person with a repentant heart. Okay? I'm going to say it again. Jesus will never turn away a person with a repentant heart. It doesn't matter how big or how little your sin. You might be sitting here this morning and you say, well, that's easy for you to say from up there, but you don't know me. You don't know the addictions that I've struggled with. You don't know the relationships that I've ruined. You don't know the things that I've been tried and convicted of. You don't know me. I might not, but God does. And I guarantee you, if you bow down in repentance to him, he is faithful to forgive you. A repentant heart will always, always have a place in God's presence. Amen? So we worship Him by bowing down in repentance. Point number two is we bow in submission. We bow in submission. I can remember a time when I was real little. I couldn't have been, I had to have been around the age of six or seven. And my mom was ironing clothes. And she set the iron on the ironing board. And she said, don't touch that. It's hot. Don't touch that iron. And I was probably like, uh-huh. Okay. And then she walks out the room. And me, being as smart and as intelligent as I was, even as a child, <laughs> I thought, I, knew, I know what's best for me. I know what's right. I think, I appreciate what you said, but I got this. I'm in control of this situation now that you've left the room. So what did I do? I walked over there and I grabbed a hold of that iron and you'll never guess what happened next. I burned my hand. Simply because I decided I wanted to be in control and I didn't submit to what my mother had told me to do. Let's talk about that word submit or submission for a second. I love the UFC. How many UFC fans do we have in the house? Cool. All five of us. Yes. Well, I'm sure some of you might know there are normally three ways that you win one of these fights, okay? One of which is by knockout. And that's my personal favorite, okay? And now... I know what you're thinking. This is one of the pastors of our church. Up here talking about how he likes to see people get knocked out. So be it. Sweep off your own front porch. All right? <laughs> I don't have a problem saying anything to you about 
your new bass boat or your $200 heels, so we're going to leave it there. <laughs> All right? So the second way you can win one of these fights is the fight goes the whole way. They go every single round, right? And then the judges score the card. And they say, you won. You lost. The third way, not always the most exciting way, is by submission. And there are all different kinds of submissions you can get put in. You can get your leg folded up behind you like a pretzel. You can get put in an arm bar. You can get put in a choke hold. And I've seen typically two different kinds of fighters whenever they get put in one of these situations. Whenever they get locked into a choke hold. And if you're a talented fighter, which most of the fights that I watch that air, they are, and somebody gets behind somebody in the right position, they're not getting out. They're done for. They've got two options at this point. They can, one, accept and listen to the signals their body is sending them. Hey, your brain is losing oxygen. You should, you should get out of this situation because their face is literally turning red and purple and blue. So what do they do? They tap. They say, I've had enough. I'm done. But I've also seen another kind of fighter in this moment. I've seen one that decides to ignore what his body's telling him. His body is saying, hey, about to go night-night. You can't do this. But for whatever reason, they think, I got this. I'm in this for the long haul. I'm in control of this situation. I'm behind the wheel. And you know what happens to them? They go night-night. <laughs> they literally get choked out, and they pass out, and then they have to rush into the ring and perform a type of CPR just to get the guy up and going again. And that kind of reminds me of some of us sometimes. We get ourselves into situations, and we ignore good counsel. We ignore what the Lord's telling us because we decide that we want to be in control. But let me tell you something. Did you know that even Jesus tapped at one time? What? What are you talking about? Jesus tapped? He did. Let me set that up for you. We read about in Luke when Jesus, he only has a few hours left to live. And he's just finished his last supper with the disciples. And he comes down out of the upper room, and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he begins to pray, and he begins to pour out his heart to God. Let's read that this morning. He walked away about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet... I want your will to be done, not mine. See, he knows what's about to happen. He knows what's coming. He knows that he's going to be beat to the point where he's almost unrecognizable as a human. He knows that they're going to strip him naked and they're going to cuss at him and they're going to spit at him. And he knows that he's about to hang on a cross, and he's in his last few hours, his last few moments of being alive in the flesh on this earth. This is, let's word it a different way. Let's say it like this. God, if you are willing, let my agenda get across. Let what I want be the way this turns out. But no matter what, God, I submit to you, and I tap. He knew what was coming, and he knew what had to be done. And he said, if you're willing, take this from me. But above all else, above all else, Father, I submit, and I tap to you. This is God Almighty in human form here on earth saying 
I don't know if I want to do this, but Father, I submit to you, and I submit to what you want. I've been in a place like that before, and some of us, sometimes we try so hard not to tap and act like we're strong. And I know exactly what you're going through. I know exactly where you've been. I spent a long time there before. I found myself in a place where I let loss and relationships and things that God told me don't have anything to do with. I I put myself in a position to where I said, I tried it your way. But I think I know best. So I think I'm going to go this way now. And I didn't handle these situations correctly. I didn't seek forgiveness. I didn't seek to forgive. I didn't try to make any kinds of amends. I ignored good counsel. I didn't always listen to wise words from my family, my friends, or my mentors. And I found myself in a place of brokenness. And I didn't know what to do. But God restored me, and he changed me. I want you to know this morning that it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But one day, we're all going to have to bow down, and we're all going to have to confess. Let's read that in Philippians 2. It says, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it may not be today, and it may not be next weekend, but one day we're all going to have to bow. I'm getting ready to close, but before I do, I've got a few things I want you to know. I've had people, since God completely changed my life a few years ago, and in that place of brokenness, I said, God, I'm sorry. I want to submit to you and what you have for me because through the whole time, it didn't matter where I was, it was like I could hear him as if he was standing at those doors right there calling my name, calling me back to him the whole time, and I didn't want anything to do with it. But I got to a place where I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm ready. I'm ready to try things your way. And it didn't happen overnight. But I started to listen to that wise counsel. I started to accept those words of knowledge. And I started serving. And I started praying like I had never prayed before. And since, at times I've had people come up and ask me, in the middle of opposition, How do you keep going? When these things happen and we saw that you were there and how it it should have affected you and how it affected everybody else, but what about you is different? Or why do people come to you for advice? Why do people come to you for help? Why are you always smiling? Or why does it always seem like you're in a good mood? Well, I want you to know something this morning, and this is my big idea. When I bow down in repentance and submission as an act of worship, God gives me the strength to stand. I'm going to say it again. When I bow down in repentance and submission as an act of worship, God gives me the strength to stand. When I find myself in a place where I'm like, God, I don't have all the answers. God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to tell these people. God, I don't feel like smiling. I don't feel like being me today. And I don't know what to do when I get down on my knees. 
and I say, I'm sorry, but I want to submit to your will, God. I need you to strengthen me right now because I got to go back out there and I need to be a reflection of you today. Amen? I want you to know the worship team is getting ready to come up. And as they do, I want you to know that no matter what you're going through, whether it be repentance you're seeking, whether it be you're trying to control your life or somebody's life around you, whatever that might be, I encourage you, don't worry about anybody else in here. It's just between you and God. It's just between you and God this morning. And you can bow, and you can lift your hands, and you can worship Him. But I encourage you to do that. And if you do, I guarantee you, God's going to meet you right where you are. Amen? I'm going to pray. God, I ask that the words that were spoken here this morning will not only permeate the hearts, but the minds as well of everyone in here, God. I ask that all across this city, that lives are being changed, and that people are being set free this morning. God, I thank you for your goodness, and I thank you for your mercy. And I thank you for your forgiveness, God. And I ask in your precious and holy name, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship.